Hello there, this is Lana Tucky. Now we're continuing on with our section 2.2 notes and now we're going to talk about continuous data. How do we organize that? Well, because it's continuous, it's going to be a little bit trickier than discrete. Discrete's pretty straightforward. I mean, you either stay in the hospital two days or three days or four days or five. You know, it's, it's not 2.36 days. They don't have that there. But continuous data does have the option for so many decimal places. And so it becomes a question of how do you organize it in such a way that everything can fall into a category, into a bin, into a class, is what we call them in statistics. Although in um, Excel and other statistics programs, they call them bins a lot of the time. All right, so we have our classes right here, just like we had before. And in every class, there's a lower class limit and an upper class limit. For example, this class right here has got a lower class limit of 40, an upper class limit of 49.9. Technically, it's 49.9999999999, right, forever. So um, we often round, I, I, the original note said always, but it's actually often. Um, so we round To a certain number of decimal places and the question is how do we get it to fit so um, it really means the upper class limit really means point in, um, everything up to and including the next class so the next class starts at 50 so everything up to 50 gets into this class so 49.9 49.99 nine, would all be in this class right here once you hit 50 you roll over into the next group now, there's a class width, there's a distance between these classes, and that width will be the width of the histogram bars when you finally make a histogram of this data, oops, wherever that may be, right? So when you make a histogram, it's got to be a certain width for the bars. So when we do make a histogram, it's going to have to be each of the bars is a certain width. All right, so that width is called the class width, and you find it by taking the difference between consecutive lower class limits, right? And we'll talk more about that with this example in a minute. And then an open-ended class is when the first class, like this class, has no lower class limit, right? I just say below 39. It's not 30 to 39. That means that there's probably one of these two people, because there's two people in this group, one of them might have scored below 30, right? So maybe it was 25 or something like that. Maybe it was 10. You don't know, right? It's, it has no lower limit, so you're not really sure where it is. By the same token, it can be open-ended that way or it can be open-ended the other way. This one actually happens to be open-ended two different ways. So also there's the above 90 group down here. So that's open-ended on the high end because is, is everybody a 90 or is it 91 or 94? Did all 12 of these people get a 97? You, you have no idea, okay? All right, so there's that. Now we're gonna find the relative frequency, cumulative frequency, and cumulative relative frequency. Well, this should be old school by this point. We've done this before. First thing we gotta do is find the totals right here. So let me grab the calculator. Let me zoom out just a little bit so I can see them all. There we go. And now I'm gonna make this smaller and bring up my calculator. All right, so two plus five. There we go. So that's 88 for the total. Yep, 88. All right, so now to find the relative frequency, I'm going to take 2 divided by 88, and that will get me my number. 0 0 0.022, well, 023, right? If we're going to do three decimal places, which I think we are. Yeah, we usually do. All right, and then 5 divided by 88, and so on. All right, I'm going to go find all these numbers, and I'll be right back with those. There, I have all the decimal points in. And these should add up to 1, or, you know, again, if they add up to 1.001, it's not the end of the world. That's just a rounding issue. And speaking of rounding, I just was thinking about this a little bit more. This is always rounded, because if it's truly continuous, like, look, take your weight. Well, your weight has lots and lots of decimal places, but you round it to the nearest tenth or the nearest pound or whatever. So we're always, always rounding these lower class or upper class limits because this one's not rounded. This is just 40, but this one is 40.9999999999 forever. Well, nobody wants to write nines forever, so we'll round them to nine or nine nine or so on. I guess the only way to not round it would be to put a little bar over it, the top of it, but we're not doing that. 
All right, now moving down here to cumulative frequency. Now cumulative frequency we just practiced before. You, this one's two, so that's kind of obvious, and basic. But they're not going to stay that way. So if that one's two, this one is seven, because two plus five makes seven, right? Then two plus five plus twelve would make nineteen. Then thirty, fifty. I'm getting that by adding all of these ones up to get me the 50, then 76, and then 88. And by the end, you should have the same number that you said was the total right over here, all right? All right, then cumulative relative frequency, you can do it one of two ways. You can add this up. You can say 0.023, there we go. Or you can say 2, this cumulative frequency, divided by the total, which was 88. And then you can do 7 divided by the total of 88, or you can try to add up these two right here. This will be a little bit less accurate if you use the decimals than if you use the whole numbers, right? Because you've rounded a little bit. The more you play around with rounded numbers, the worse it's going to be. Right? Hence, um, science teachers get all up in your gears about significant figures. That's why, right? There's good reason for it, right? It's because you're compounding errors, right? All right, then 19 divided by 88 would be 0 0.216, and so on. I'm going to find the rest of these, and I'll be right back. And just for fun, um, while I was away, I also found this to actually come out to be 0 0.999. Again, we have a little bit of rounding issues over here. And again, that's going to happen. So don't don't be surprised. Don't beat yourself up. It, it just happens if, oopsie, I didn't mean to do that. There, that's the one I meant. All right. So, and the, the trouble actually happened right around here with these two numbers. It just wasn't going to work out, right? That's why it's better if you stick with these numbers. These will be a little bit more accurate than if you stick with these. But in the end, if you come up with 0.999, you know, as long as you show your work, everybody, everything will be fine. Or explain what you did. Won't be a big problem. All right, so now let's go back here, and we've got to state the third class. So let's look. So the way this goes is this is the first class right here, that first row. That's the second class. That's the third class. So the third class is 50 to 59.999. Okay. Now the second class is lower class limit. That's the, This is the second class right here. The lower class limit is 40. Okay, the sixth class is upper class limit. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is the sixth class right here. So 89.9. Now find the class width by hand. All right, so class width, class width is equal to um, difference of consecutive lower class limits. All right, difference means subtraction. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, let's say, you can't use the first class because it doesn't have a lower class limit. So let's use these two right here, 40 and 50. So let me highlight them. This is the first lower class limit. This is the consecutive lower class limit, right? The next, consecutive means next. So 40 and 50 are how far apart? So this is 50 take away 40, that would be 10. And there we go. Now you could have actually found it with any of them. 60 and 50, 10 apart. 70 and 60, 10 apart. And in case you haven't noticed, 69 and 79, 10 apart. 59 and 69, 10 apart. 79 and 89, 10 apart. So you can find it a whole bunch of different ways, but you have to do the difference of consecutive ones. You don't want to do 49 take away 40. That's not going to work. It's 10 wide, not 9 wide. All right, explain why this is an open-ended distribution. Well, there's two reasons. Um, so let me type those up one second. There we go. So this is open-ended for two reasons. One is that we don't have a beginning to your first class. It says before 39.9. So that's open-end on the low end. So open on the low end of the table. And then it's open on the high end because it says above 90. So you can actually be open-ended two different directions. You can be open-ended on the low side or you can be open-ended on the high side. This table actually is both. 
So it's doubly bad. It's not really bad. It's just sometimes it's more convenient to organize that way. Now, what was the mode student score? Well, it's gray area, but we know that the modal class is 80 to 89.9 .9 right here because it has the highest frequency of 26. We don't actually know the score though, right? So we know the modal class is 80 to 89.9. .9. Now, what percent of students score 59.9 .9 or less? 59.9 .9 or less. So you can see that a couple ways. Percents that are below 59 or 59 or less are these three. But you've already added those three up. Let me highlight them um, here, those three. So you've already added those three up, and it's right here. That's what cumulative relative frequency finds for you. So it's 0.216, which is 21.6%. And there we have it. All right, now to pass the test, to pass the final exam, a student needs to score 70% or higher. What percent of students pass the exam, right? All right, so let's think. To not pass means you score below 70. So 70 is passing right here. So the percent of students that are below passing would be all of these ones, these four groups right here. These are all the people that did not pass. What do these add up to? Well, the percentage that they add up to is right here, 0 0.341. I'm going to make it pink. Okay, So 0 0.341, that's what these four numbers would have added up to. So if 0 0.341 do not pass, that means, let me write that down. Um, not passing equals... 69.9% or less, which would be scores. And what percentage of students scored that low? 34.1. So that means passing scores 70% or higher. That would be 1 minus, or here, let me put this way, 100% minus. 34.1%, which would be 60, so 65.9% have passed the test. There we have it. That little calculation, by the way, will come back to haunt you in the probability chapter, chapter 5. Very important, the, whole, the fact that the whole thing must add up to 100%. All right, why can't we be sure if any students received 100%? Well, let's see here. Um, the last class is written as above 90. So all 12 of those students could be, actually, technically it should have been 90 and above. Right? So let me switch that to 90 and above because technically people that scored 90 should fall in there. So 90 and above. Sorry about that. Okay. So we don't know what they actually scored. Could have scored 90 or all could have scored 100. We do not know the raw scores of those. 12 students. And that's not just because it's open-ended. It's because it's a class. That would happen to us in any of these groups. We don't know what these 20 students did. Were they all 70? Were they all 75? Were some of them 75 and some of them 78? We have no idea, right? It has to do with the fact that you're binning people. Once you start binning people, you don't know where they're going to end up. There we go. So note that this is true of each of the classes. They're grouped into bins. So we don't know how many students scored in 62, 84. We don't know because they're grouped into classes. So they're grouped in classes in the table. All right, we're done with that example. I'll see you back here for the next part.